nicht so schade. Nicht so schade. Das ist nicht so nicht so wie wir schon dran zu fahren. Enchanté. Enchanté. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, fine with Lois. It's okay, thank you. <laughs> Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, gracias por, por estar aquí en, esta, en este esfuerzo de la doctora Rashida que, que viene desde de Australia. Bueno, no específicamente a la, a la plática, pero sí, digamos, una parte importante de su tiempo lo está dedicando a tratar de contribuir al conocimiento de todos nosotros en el tema precisamente de la estadística, de la geostadística. Eh, eh, quiero también agradecer bueno, al, al, al Instituto de, de, de Geografía por permitirnos el espacio y sobre todo a la parte del sistema de transmisión vía internet, a los cuales a los que nos están viendo, pues también me, les doy las, eh, las gracias por, por el interés en esta, en esta plática que, que de seguro va a ser de, de mucho eh, beneficio para el manejo de su información. Eh, en una forma muy rápida voy a presentar a la doctora Rashida, ella es eh, eh, economista, econometrista, es en censo estricto, ella hizo su doctorado en, en la Universidad de Montreal en, en Canadá y luego hizo su doctorado en la Universidad de Boston en Estados Unidos y actualmente está trabajando en la Universidad de Nueva Gales del Sur y bueno pues como tal vez como mejor noticia nos va a dar su plática en inglés, o a menos que quieran que se les dé en árabe, marroquí o en francés, <ríe> que es este, el pequeño repertorio que tiene ella para, para compartir con ustedes su conocimiento. Entonces, este, les dejo, me I have the opportunity to thank uh, Rashida for your um, uh, interest and, and goodwill to, to let us know a little bit about your vast of knowledge in uh, uh, econometrics. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the pleasure of mine. So I'd like to first thank uh, Dr. Joao Rivera for the invitation and also for organizing this seminar at a very short notice. I also would like to thank my sister, Samira, <laughs> who initiated this, uh, this trip. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to thank everybody who's here today. I know that this is kind of a very early time of the, the year, and many people are busy with other stuff. 
So as uh, Joel had mentioned, I'm from economics at the business school. So I'm out outside your research kind of area. But at the talk today is going to be framed or the application is going to be framed in an economic problem, but the methodology, the issues, the challenges, and the statistical uh, problem behind um, uh, the application of the methods is going to be applied to many disciplines and sciences. So as the title says, so I'm going to be talking about one of the issues with big data. So I don't know if it's something in your uh, domain People are talking about big data nowadays in everywhere. And big data comes with opportunities, but also comes with challenges from the point of view of analyzing the data, making models and making, um, um, getting information from the data and useful information. So there are a number of challenges. So I'm going to be talking about one case where we have some of the challenges with big data, which is forecasting or making predictions. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about two methods that have been uh, very popular in the statistical um, uh, literature and also now in economics and in econometrics. Is one method is called Bayesian model averaging. So it's from the Bayesian uh, side of statistics. And then this from the frequentist side of statistics is principal component analysis. And the two methodologies have been used to kind of solve the problem of big data. How can we kind of make use of big data? Um, so as I said, I think the flavor of the paper is more in economics. I'll try, um, I will show you in a couple of slides that you can put any name on the variables of depending on, on your application, it wouldn't matter. You can just call them y and x, and it doesn't really matter. So the methodologies are the same. But um, being from economics, the application is going to be from that area. So in economics, um, in the last 20 years, we had uh, a growing uh, influx of data. So that data is becoming uh, easily available. So financial institution, uh, government bodies are collecting a lot of information. Also, you go to um, supermarkets, you use your credit card, your, uh, you have now membership cards, and all those are collecting information. So we have a huge number of data that is collected everywhere. So the issue is how can we make use of that information? So what we call here time series, in my case, is for example, you correct information on a number of variables. So each variable has a time series. So now we have a large number of time series. And what's happened is that in, only in the last 20 years that people in statistics uh, and also in economic modeling that started to kind of deal with this problem of large data because a lot of standard modeling methods or st standard statistical methods do not apply anymore when you have big data. So before, you have a number of observations of 30 years, or um, even if you have monthly data over 30 years, you have two, 300 observations. Nowadays, for example, in finance, you have terabytes of data. So whatever applies for 300 data points is not going to be applied when you have a terabyte of data points. So the statistical met methods are different. So, so this is in economics now. Uh, I guess this is probably not very useful for you. So for, in economics, we have many applications and we have a lot of data. But um, to just convince you that um, the problem of big data applies to other sciences. So for example, uh, some recent studies in economics, people were looking at applying some of the econometrics tools that are developed in, for example, forecasting the El Nino. So maybe this is closer to science than to economics and probably more interest for you guys. So you can think of uh, the, the, the traditional way of forecasting El Nino in the, in the past. You used the past observation on, uh, collected on uh, El Nino events, and you used that to forecast the futures. You used some kind of what we call univariate models. But now because of the advent of uh, statistical tools that can handle uh, large data, we can actually uh, use other variables, not just the time series of unlinear events or observations on 
past uh, El Nino occurrences, you can actually use um, observation on other variables. So you would have 24 other variables that you collect that might have relationship. And we, we do find that in a number of studies that this El Nino variable has intricate correlation with a number of other variables. So the question is, how can you make use, for example, of 24 other variables? How can you make use of that information, of the correlations of those variables with the El Nino time series to make good inference? This is an example where you could think of it. It's not a big data because 24 is still not a big data, but it's a case where you can make use of um, now, in medical science, they use, there is an issue of big data. It's uh, uh, something that, for example, MRI, MRI scans. So uh, you would have this fraction of second images of the brain um, uh, kind of activities. And you will have collecting that a large number of information for each patient. So now, how can you make sense of that huge number of information that you get from these scans to get a sense of, is this patient suffering from a special kind of anomaly in the brain? So it's a field also that we use. The same methods I'm going to be talking about today is used to, to do what we call classification with uh, using MRI data to do forecasting and Nino and a number of other applications. But as I said, here I'm just going to be talking about a case of forecasting inflation. Uh, hopefully, there will be some interest. Maybe inflation is kind of, um, yeah, it's not that difficult to understand, um, uh, I guess, the importance of the application for um, central banks and reserve banks because um, if you are the, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank or the Central Bank, you want to make a policy uh, decision today. You want to know if tomorrow you're going to raise the interest rate. So you need to input the information about what inflation is going to be tomorrow or next quarter. So you need that piece of information. So in economics, for reserve banks, they always need to make a forecast for inflation in the, in the future because they cannot make any decisions about the monetary policy. Um, to print more money or to change interest rates without knowing that. So it's a very important kind of variable that economists struggle to actually make good forecasts. Um, so anyway, so that's why in economics it's a, it's a very kind of occurring uh, example. Now, as I said, the big data problem is when you have a lot of variables, uh, standard methods, when I say standard method, if you do an, um, an ordinary least square regression, you have a y variable and a set of x variables. You do that regression, it's not valid anymore, and sometimes you cannot run it. You cannot actually uh, use it when you have a large data set. And I will tell you why. And if people are interested in more details, I, I have slides with a lot of details, but I will just skip them unless there is uh, interest. So recently, at least in statistical literature and economics and econometrics, uh, there has been a huge kind of interest in the literature on developing new methods. So we call them inference methods. So when you do a regression analysis, what you want to know, you want to know, for example, if you change, for example, if you change interest rates, what's going to happen to inflation tomorrow. So you do kind of, you estimate a model with a regression. That kind of inference, is that a significant relationship or not? Uh, these inference methods um, have to change to adapt to the large data set example. What we call the curse of dimensionality so is that term is from a couple of, uh, of economists and financial economists uh, who were pioneering a number of the uh, of these methods. So they call it the curse of dimensionality. Dimensionality means that you have a big dimension problem, a big data problem. So that's the dimensionality, what we mean by that. And it's a curse because you cannot use your simple regression model. You have to do something about it. Otherwise, it's all rubbish. The results are not informative. OK, so here are just uh, the mini predictors or the, the big data prediction problem. So here to just sit, set the, 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 the statistical kind of uh, uh, setting, as I said, you can call this variable whatever you want. So if you have a variable of interest in your case, in your 
uh, application and you want to kind of explain it with another variable, so to try to forecast its dynamics in the future, so you can call that variable your key variable of interest. Now, to forecast one or more than vari one variable, and then we have predictors. You have a number of other variables that you think have information about this key variable of interest. So I have n of them, that uppercase n or big N. Now, and you have a sample size. Sample size is observation. So you collect rainfall information over a number of days. Uh, in a year, you have 300 and uh, maybe observations. And then that's the sample size t. So that's just the sample size and number of observations. Now, in the standard statistical uh, models, n is, has to be small and much smaller than t. Because if you estimate a regression model, then n is going to be the same as the number of variables in your regression model. You need more observations to estimate the model than things that you don't know. So n in your model is, is going to be the number of parameters you need to estimate. So those are the things you don't know. So you need to have t, which is number of observation, the information. So you need enough information to know something about what you don't know. So in the standard statistical framework, n is smaller than t, the number of those variables. However, in the big data case, n is much, much larger than t. That's what's happened. So you can have, in economics, for example, in, the, uh, that in forecasting, I would have quarterly data over maybe 10 years, 20 years, and I'm ha I have three, 400 predictors in the economy. So N is actually much, much larger. So the question is like, what do you do then? Okay, so that's kind of uh, the, big, the, the big data problem that's challenged. Now, of course, big data also has opportunities because more variables means more information. More information gives you better results. You're going to make more better decisions. Uh, better inference, statistical inference, if you have a lot of information. So it's a pity to say, well, n is large, I'm just going to pick 10 variables from the 300, and I'm going to use them, and I'm just going to throw away the rest. You're throwing uh, useful information. So we want to make use of that big N, and we want to make use of that, what you call the blessing of uh, dimensionality. So um, I'm going to talk about the model later on. But let's just say, what do people uh, do in the literature to tackle this problem of uh, mini predictors and a small sample size? So this is the big data problem. Now, I think different uh, disciplines define big data differently because it depends on the application, on the challenge. But here, our big data is large and mini predictors that you have to put in the equation and a smaller sample size. So there are two techniques in, in statistics and econometrics. Uh, there are some techniques that we call dense modeling techniques, and there are techniques that we call sparse modeling techniques. Now, from the name dense and sparse, we can get an idea or intuition of what it is. So dense modeling techniques, they say, well, I have 300 macroeconomic variables that can tell me something about inflation. So these 300 macroeconomic variables, especially in the economy, they all react into the markets to government you know, policies, all, uh, all kinds of things. So really, those 300 variables, they will have in common some dynamics that we can kind of uh, summarize and condense. So instead of having 300 macroeconomic variables, we can actually condense them in a smaller number of 40 core factors. And that's what principal components I'm going to talk about does. So principal component takes a big data matrix and shrinks the dynamic of that matrix into a fewer number of uh, components or factors. So you're going to say, well, in the economy, you have 300 macroeconomic variables, but all those variables are maybe driven by interest rates, inflation, and monetary policy. Maybe these are the three kind of key drivers of the dynamics in the economy. So that's the idea of this dense modeling technique. Now, um, model averaging, that's going to be the other methodology I'm going to be talking about, and Bayesian model averaging is a, 
um, an example because there are different ways of doing modern averaging. So modern averaging says, well, you cannot put 300 variables in the equation. What you can do, you can have, you can estimate a, a number of models with smaller numbers, say, say the sample size T is 100, and you can maybe estimate a model uh, reasonably well with maybe 15 variables in it. So you can do estimate many models of 15 variables each time you choose a different set of 15 variables from those 300. So you're going to have a number of these models. And then instead of picking up one model, you average the results from those models that you have estimated. And that's what we call model averaging. So instead of picking one and commit to one model, because you don't know if that's a true model, obviously, because we don't know what's the, what is the model that created the variables in the economy. All what we know is what we observe these variables. So you can average the results from that large number of estimated models. So each model can be estimated because you choose a smaller number of variables in it, but you change the variables in each one and then you, you average them. Factor models, they don't. Factor model just takes the 300 variables, extracts the main uh, drivers from those 300s, and then says, OK, I have the, a small number of um, drivers of the, of the information in that big number of predictors. And then so this, this talk today is going to be talking about comparing what we call uh, one type of model averaging, Bayesian model averaging. There's other ways, frequencies, they have many ways of averaging, and there's a huge debate on what's the best way, and the answer is like there's no best way. Uh, each model is, is good under a certain set of assumptions. It just depends on what assumption you're happy to make in your case and what assumptions you're happy to, to kind of accept. Uh, and they all have kind of their weaknesses and strengths, so it just depends on uh, the application. So I'm going to try to compare uh, in this project that uh, this talk is from, compares how these Bayesian methods um, behaves in comparison to uh, principal components analysis because at the time where I, I was working on this project uh, a couple of years ago, the two literatures were kind of separate. People who did principal components, they did principal components, and the Bayesian uh, people did Bayesian model averaging. And it was not clear if they are kind of common uh, dynamics or behaviors in terms of uh, the quality of the forecasting or prediction between the two methods. And then there's another literature that talks about sparse technique. So sparse technique, as the word sparse means, is that you actually commit to a model. So you can say, I'm not going to take 300 variables. You can ad hoc just do what we call variable selection. So there are methods in the statistic that try to give you an estimate of the best model. Because if there is a model that creates inflation, that true model have a number of variables in it. So there are some variable selection techniques that try to give you the best estimate of that true model. So you commit to that model. Or there are some uh, techniques that actually put all the variables in the model and then just kills the one that are not very important. So in statistics, there is something called lasso or ridge that tries to do that. But we're not talking about that today. OK, so I'm not going to talk about this. I mean, this was just talking about that project I was doing and what the contribution to the literature. So it's not really kind of, I'm going to skip that just to talk about the methodology. And uh, we'll talk about the result later on. So. Um, so don't worry about the notation, but what I'm trying, I'm going to use this slide just to kind of point to uh, intuitively what these methods are trying to do. So principal component methods, as I said, is one of what we call dense uh, modeling techniques. So you have uh, a number of variables, we call them n. So those variables are collected in some matrix X. So X is just this matrix that collects these n predictors, right? Now, principal component says, is, while X, there's a lot of repeated information. So if you take um, uh, different measures of interest rates, if you look at uh, the national accounts, 
we're going to have at least 20 different measures of interest rate. Right? So you're going to have a number of uh, measures of price indices. All these variables have repeated information, redundant information. So it says, well, really, there are just a small number of drivers in this big X. So we're going to try to extract them. So instead of having N is 300, maybe there are only a smaller number of what we call factors. Maybe there's three or four instead of those 300. So what's principal component? method does try to estimate those main co-movements between those that large number of predictors. So we call them F hats. So F hats are the principal components of X. Now, um, principal components are very straightforward methods. It's very easy. And uh, it's well established in the statistical literature since uh, I think um, early last century. So, um, it's very easy to implement, so I'm not going to talk about the details of it. If you're, I think a lot of statistical um, softwares will give you a principal component of any data metrics you do, or you can do it by hand. So you take the eigenvectors of x, the eigenvalues of uh, the covariance matrix of x, and then you look at the eigenvectors corresponding to those, the, high, the largest eigenvalues. And that gives you your f hats, your principal components. So now, this factor models where it says, well, instead of using x and having the problem that I have a large number of variables in x, now I have a smaller number in f hat. I only have this little r. And that r is going to be 3, 4, 5. Um, in the example of forecast inflation, my n, the x matrix, has about 130 predictors and the R is estimated to be three or four. So it really kind of condenses the information, and it's, it shrinks the dimensionality of the problem. So then instead of using X to predict a variable Y, so Y, for example, for me is inflation, now you're going to use F hat to predict inflation, because you're going to say F hat has all the important info information in this X matrix, which can be useful for predicting or forecasting my y variable. So here, for the notation y is the variable of interest. That's your El Nino um, uh, um, occurrence in the future or event. So that you want to predict it. And then x is all those 24 variables that are related to the region. Uh, and then you want to, instead of using 24, you're going to use a smaller number. Maybe there are two or three. Um, uh, factors in that matrix. And then, and then this is a standard problem. So any OLS software can give you a prediction because it's a linear regression model. Instead of regressing Y variable on X, now you regress the Y variable on this small number F hats, smaller number of variables. So that's what principal component regression does. It's very kind of straightforward um, to implement. Now, Bayesian model averaging, now, I don't know if Bayesian techniques are very kind of known or widely known in your discipline, but um, in economics, only in the last 10, 15 years that people in macroeconometrics started using Bayesian techniques because computers are becoming faster and faster. Um, in statistics, I mean, the, the idea be, behind Bayesian statistics is very kind of simple, but the problem in the past was that computers were not fast because Bayesian techniques uh, use a lot of uh, simulation methods. So you need fast computers because you have to do a large number of simulations to, to get kind of good results of the statistical method. But recently, because now computers are very large, so people are finding Bayesian methods are very useful. And one of the reasons why Bayesian methods also have been very popular in macroeconomics because um, if, you, if you work, a lot of reserve banks are using them because uh, if it, they have huge models that they have to estimate and they have to calibrate. And a lot of time, the, if you use standard techniques, you will have what we call a likelihood function. And a lot of time, it does not converge. You try to, to find estimates of the parameters. You have too many parameters. You have a highly high dimensional problem. It, your maximum likelihood estimation or OLS is not going to be converging. So people use Bayesian method because Bayesian method you can put what we call some prior and then kind of restrict 
the model. So instead of having like some function or algorithm that's trying to find the solution all over the place, with Bayesian method, you can actually put some information and tell the algorithm, okay, I want you to look only in this area. Don't look everywhere. Which you cannot really do in frequentist way when you do all OLS for maximum likelihood estimation because it looks like an assumption and people don't like assumptions if you cannot justify them, right? But in a Bayesian framework, it fits better because you just say, I'm just putting a prior belief about something and then uh, it's more accepted, okay? So Bayesian methods again. So here a lot of details, but the idea is that Bayesian, Bayesian method says, okay, I want to estimate a parameter um, in my equation. Now, instead of just doing an OLS of Y or X and getting an estimate of beta or B, the, the parameters, uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a prior belief about what do I think this parameter is. And it's useful, for example, if you are a researcher and you have a lot of info, uh, information or experience with the problem, sometimes it's, it's good to put that information into the estimation because in estimation, information is always useful. The more information you have, the better. So instead of just letting the algorithm look everywhere, if you have any informed uh, or information that's useful, you can actually add it. So if I know that, for example, the probability of a person being a smoker in a, in a group is, is not 0.5 because the algorithm just gonna starts with half-half, 50-50, because it doesn't know anything, so you're just gonna say, I'm gonna have a belief that it's 50-50. So if you know that you are in a group where from knowledge, from past experience, from other things that you have, the probability of being a smoker, for example, is more likely to be 30%, then it's, you can add this information and then collect the data from that group of people and estimate the probability of being a smoker using your prior and also information from the data you collect. So that's what Bayesian technique does. It allows you to have a prior. So you have a belief. This is what I think the parameters are gonna be. Then you go, you collect the data. You say, this is the information from the data. And then you form what we call posterior uh, result or distributions or posterior uh, estimates. Then you can say, given the data and given my belief, do I still hold my belief at 30% uh, smokers in my population? Or from the data, maybe in your estimated number in the data, you actually found 90, people, 90 out of 100 are smokers. Then you can say, well, my prior belief at 30% is very unlikely to be true because in my sample, I have 90 out of 100 are smokers. So now your posterior estimate of for example, of probability of smoke is gonna be higher than your initial belief of 30%. So Bayesian techniques allows you to have a prior belief, add information from the sample, and then form what we call a posterior belief or a posterior uh, decision. Okay, now, those of you who use Bayesian techniques, you have to be aware about a number of things. You need to know what beliefs or prior beliefs you have to use because, um, I mean, a lot of people are caught like cheating in a way because people say, well, I got very good results. But their result actually, they got the result because, because they put the belief in a way to get that result, right? So uh, you need to know what the prior, uh, what we call prior distributions or prior beliefs that you are, for example, if using um, a software, for example, one of software that does Bayesian stuff is Winbox. So if you just press the button, you give the data, and you press on a button, you get results. So you really have to understand or know what are the prior beliefs that that algorithm puts as a default, because that's really drives the results. So, and then especially in linear regression models, when you just have a Y variable and X variable and you wanna regress them, what you put in is what you get. Or what you get at the end is really a function of what you put in as a prior. So it's really important to know that. Now, one of the priors you want to look at are, are, are the priors about in, in this kind of modeling when I have, for example, inflation and I have a number of predictors on the right-hand side. I need to know what's the probability of each predictor to be in that equation. Because that's what it is. Because you don't know if you have 300 predictors, you don't know which one is in or which one should be out. 
So you have to make a decision. Are all the predictions have the same probability to be in and out? And, and is this what we call uniform? Because if you don't know anything, you're just going to say, well, interest rate could be in the, the equation of, of, um, of inflation 50%, 50%. Because if I don't know, then I don't need to change. It should be just 50-50. And that's what, being not somebody who's um, an expert in monetary policy and economics, you can just say what we call uh, an, an no informative prior. That means that your prior doesn't have any information to tell you which way you go. Right? So if you know something more, so for example, if you know that maybe, um, I don't know, um, some exchange rate is going to be more important than, I don't know, the price of housing prices in that equation, and you're going to say, well, maybe that should have a higher probability or not. So that's one thing you have to decide. The other thing you have to decide is um, what we call the distribution of the parameters. So in your equation, you have y and x. So you need to find the parameters on those predictors x. You need to also make a, a prior uh, decision on how does the distribution of that uh, those parameters looks like. So here I use the notation beta. So you can say R beta is close to be zero, R be more spread, can be anywhere. So, um, uh, so there are the two main things you need to say. What's the probability of each variable to be in and out of that equation? And then how does, once it's in that equation, how far the value of the true parameter beta is away from zero? Okay, you want to know what's the spread of the distribution. So that's the two main things. And of course, these things are very standard uh, results in the statistical literature, as I said, because um, Bayesian techniques have um, a very old kind of uh, uh, history in uh, statistics and well established. So anyway, so I have a y variable. That's my El Nino or classific MRI classification or inflation. I have x are my predictors, and the beta are the parameters on those x. So you can see that Bayesian model averaging, it doesn't, it, it keeps the x matrix there with the large number of predictors. So what it's going to do is going to be searching over this space of all these parameters, betas, and it's going to see which ones are more likely to be there. It's going to calculate these probabilities of a variable to be in or out. And then it's going to say, well, you started with 50% of any variables to be there. From the data we observe, the dynamics between the variables, this variable now has only 10%. And other variables have more chances to be in the model. So that's what Bayesian Techniques does. And then it will uh, average, as I said, uh, Bayesian model averaging. Then you have a number of models that it will estimate. And then it will average over all of them. Now, as I said, there's a lot of, um, I mean, we really have to be kind of very careful about when we use uh, softwares because there are a lot of things that have to be set up as a default, uh, set up as default. And um, so this is just to say that there are a lot of what we call tuning parameters. And the way you set them up is going to um, determine in a way how the posterior results are going to look like. And there are a number of ways in the literature that people have looked at different parameters to be to have like um, you no know, informative prior, to have informative priors, and all kind of things. So, um, so then, so remember, my y variable is the variable of interest. I want to forecast the value of that variable in the future. So what I'm using here as a notation, uh, y sub t plus h. So t is today, and I want to forecast in the future. So this is just the time period, index for the time period. So t is today, and plus h, h say, two periods in the future. So in inflation case, I have monthly data, maybe I have quarterly data. So this is just uh, maybe h can be two months in the future, or two quarters in the future, or one year, which is four quarters, or something like that. So it just tells me what I want to forecast. Now, in the principal components factor model case, we just projected. We did a regression of yt on, on the factors. 
and then we estimated that regression and we used that to project in the future. Bayesian model averaging does not do that. It actually estimates what we call the whole distribution of white T plus H in the future. It tells you this is all the possible possibilities of these variables, the whole distribution. So we call it, I call it PP just for the distribution, probability distribution, which means any possible value of white T plus H, it gives you what's the likelihood or the probability of observing that value. This is just to tell you, given the information at time t. So I'm, I'm putting myself today, and I know something up from today till uh, far past, and I want to know something about the future. So what it does is actually average them. So it takes an average over a number of models that it estimates, and it uses that as, an, as a projection for the future. So this y hat, estimates of my y in the future, this is just slash here, just condition or given what I know at time t. Uh, this PM just to say posterior mean because it's a posterior average. Uh, it's, an, it's a Bayesian model averaging, so it's an average. And uh, over a number of values that you get from each model. So you're going to be estimating a large number of models and averaging over them. Now, in my case, this S that I say like uh, Bayesian Techniques are highly computational, so in my case, I think this S has to be something like 200,000. So it has to be a large number to be able to, to span all the space of possible models. Because if I have, so if I have, for example, 130 variables, the number of possible models is 2 to the power 130. So a huge number. So to be able actually to go over that model, the space, and estimate every possible model, every combination of all those 130 variables and estimate that model, get a, a prediction and average them, that's a huge number. Okay, two to the power 130, I don't remember what the number was, but it's a number. So here with 92 is 5,000 quadrillion models. That's a large number of models to estimate. That's why um, they are computationally very intense. Okay, so just to give you a kind of, I mean, as I said, I apologize that maybe the application is boring for you guys. But anyway, so this is one of the standard application in the literature in economics. And as I said, um, uh, this guy, Stokan Watson, started this uh, literature in 2002. And still people are struggling to find a good forecasting model for inflation. And especially in the US, because they had a period of Inflation targeting with the with the Fed uh, uh, set like a target, a fixed target for inflation. So the actual inflation was not moving a lot. So there was not a lot of information to get from inflation. So there was not a lot of information in the series of inflation today to tell you something about the future. So people start looking at this big data model. Can we learn something about other variables around inflation in the economy to say something about inflation in the future? There's a lot of variables, and um, I guess this is not really important. So in this case, I have yeah monthly data from 1959 to 2009. So the sample size. Um, so what we do, um, if you wanna if you want to compare m uh, methodologies, you have to be kind of fair, and you have to kind of give the methods like fair go, right? So here we're gonna be having like a horse race between this principal component analysis and Bayesian model averaging. So what I do, I actually do what we call uh, this pseudo out of sample forecasting, which means uh, instead of saying I have my sample, usually what's, peop what's standardly then you have a sample of size, I don't know, 100, you estimate regression model of three variables, and then you look at the predicted values y hat, that's what we call in-sample uh, fit. And a lot of time, models do well.
Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a lot of instability because policy, uh, monetary policy changes, so a lot of things in the economy change. So you cannot actually have the same model being uh, performing well all the time. So what I do here is I say I do 10 years by 10 years. So I start from, so what I have, um, from 1970, and I look, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna estimate the first model using the data from 1959 to 1969, just about 120 uh, points, that's a sample size 120. I estimate the model, and I'm gonna say, I want to forecast the first month in 1970 using the model I estimated with this first uh, 10 years of data. So I get a forecast for the first month in 1970, and because I know what inflation was in that first month in 1970, I can compare now how does, did that model perform with respect to the true value of inflation that we actually saw, right? So I actually can say if it was close or not. And I can actually judge which model was closer to that value of inflation. But of course, to be fair, maybe that was just a chance that that model did well in that first month of 1970 and the other model was not lucky. Um, so you have to do this over a number of periods to say, well, this model really does always bad or this model does always well. So I keep doing this. So once I forecast that first month of 1970, I move the window. So now my sample size T of 120 starts from the second month of 1959 to the first month of 1970. And then I'm gonna say, I want to forecast the second month of 1970. And I do the same thing. I compare which model did better. And I do that, that rolling window of 10 years up to 2009. So now I will have 458 forecasts that I can compare. And then obviously, if a model does always bad over these 458 months, then Obviously, this model is not just by chance. This model is actually really doing bad. So I'm going to compare these two methodologies using this exercise of out-of-sample evaluation over a number of uh, future uh, months, and 458 of them. OK, uh, I don't have a lot of time, but a, lot, a number of things to evaluate forecasts. So you can look at what we call the mean square forecast error, which means you just look at the squares of the differences between the forecast and the true value. As I said, I forecast it, and because this is the past, I know the value of the true of inflation, for example. So I can actually look uh, at what you call the forecast error. So that E hat is just a forecast error the difference between what I really see and what I thought the value of inflation is going to be. I'm going to square it, and I'm going to sum it over all those uh, months, right? Over these 458 months. So for each month, I'm going to say, what is the error I made in the forecast? I'll square it, and I'm going to average them over those months. And you're going to say, well, maybe the one, the model that has the highest uh, average error is the worst one because on average that model gives you more errors in forecasting than the other one. So that's one way. Now um, there are other ways that people found that this mean square forecast error maybe is not the best way because um, and then people starting doing kind of statistical tests to say uh, do the two models um, have the same errors, is it statistically, statistically significant or not? Because this mean square forecast error can give you two numbers. For example, maybe the first model, the mean square forecast error is 0.82, for example, and the second model is 0.32. The question is, is that difference really important? There are different, one is higher, but does it matter? Is it statistically 
important. So people came up with statistical tests to say that one model statistically significantly does worse than another, not just kind of by looking at the uh, face value of the numbers. I mean, of course, is the question, is it practically significant? Because maybe uh, a 0 0.01 difference is not statistically significant, but maybe for the MRI scan uh, application, any small difference is really important because it makes a difference between a good diagnosis of an ab uh, abnormality in the brain or not. So there is the statistical significance, but there's also the practical significance, which is kind of different. It depends on the application. There's also another thing that's important in econometrics and economics people came up with is that to say, well, some models do better in different times. So maybe in times of stability, some models do better than others. And then we call what we call this local relative performance. Because that mean square forecast error is an average over the whole sample. So it doesn't tell you how the model does in different areas of the sample size, which can be very important. You know, it could be in the El Nino, maybe the geographical area. Instead of just looking at an average over all areas, maybe you want to look at uh, locally how the, model, the models are doing. So we have what we call this fluctuation statistic, which looks at the performance uh, over different time periods. OK, so I'm just going to uh, maybe show you some results, because I have only have five minutes. Um, OK, now. If you, if, you, if you work with data and then any statistical model, you have to make a lot of decisions, right? So in the principal component, uh, regression or PCR, remember I told you that we, we extract a smaller number of factors from this big X matrix, but I didn't tell you how to, to choose those R factors, right? I just told you um, instead of having N in X, now I have a small R. This R can be three, two, three, four. The question is how to decide what is that small r. So you actually have to estimate that small r. And there is a number of ways people are looking at how to estimate that. The idea is you, you, you look at the r that gives you the most uh, variance in x or explained variance in x, because that's going to be telling you, OK, these are the main drivers, the rest it's just giving you redundant information about this economy for the, for the example of inflation. OK, so estimating R is a, a first decision that's problem. And then there are methods, and there is a huge literature in econometrics trying to say what's the best way to do R. And then you know there are tens of papers that agree and disagree on that. But that's the first thing. And then you have to. Uh, you can either use one of those methods, or maybe you can look at what the R that gives you the best performance. So I'm going to just uh, skip this. So here I just looked at my sample. It's from 1970 to 2009. That's my out-of-sample um, uh, evaluation period. And you can see, so for any kind of research, the question is, this really is a lot of decision to make. And then if I look here at this sample, so it gives me, just tells me what is the number of factors in that X matrix that has 92 or 100, I don't remember, 92 variables. And the answer is different depending on where on the sample you are. So it's really kind of um, dependent on a lot of things. So you cannot just say, my model for this factor model, I'm just going to choose a number of factors is two or three. So here is also time variance. So you can see that in some methods, in some areas, it chooses four factors. In some times, it chooses three, and so on. So there is a lot of instability. And then it just shows that even the first step in doing that method, you have to make a decision. And then um, there is a lot of uncertainty about it. Anyway, so this is one thing. I looked at how these models work with different R's, and I, I'm going to choose the, the best R. R. So here, um, IP is industrial production, because uh, in this literature, they look at inflation, but they also look at the output growth or changes in industrial production. 
and CPR or the consumer price index changes in the CPI are inflation. So CPI is just the consumer price index. And that looks at, you look at a number of things. So here I'm looking at different values of R. You know, R is the number of factors in X, and then how they perform in terms of mean square forecast error, which is the best R that gives me the best mean square forecast error over that out-of-sample out evaluation period. And that looks at a number of statistical things. And it turns out that R with four kind of a, um, a safe choice, so you can see that, uh, I mean, in some areas, four is kind of overestimating, you know. Uh, the number of factors, but that's okay because the extra three factors is going to be additional. They're not going to give you much information, but they're not going to hurt because my sample size is 120. I can estimate a model with four variables, right? Um, in some cases here, of course, uh, the model says you should have five or six, and then you took in four, and in, in terms of performance, it didn't seem to matter that much having four or six. Okay, now comparing the two methods in terms of um, just five minutes and all stuff, uh, in terms of uh, these performance uh, methods, um, it's really actually hard, hard to say general, like as a, as a um, at, if I want to give a, a summary, it's very hard to say that principal component does always better or that BMA does always better. So there is a a lot of variation depending on the time period and also depending on the performance measure. So BMA will do better in terms of some performance measure than, than principal components and vice versa and on different uh, time periods and also for different variables. So uh, I looked at a lot of things. So in, as I said, in the US, they had like, in, in economics, we have this uh, because they had this period of inflation targeting, so they call it the great moderation period, and then you have before that, where inflation would jump in around, so it was free to move, and then you have the full sample. So even taking, looking at which sample, so the message from there is that if you do an analysis with a sample, sometimes it's worth looking at if there are any kind of um, events that might split or create changes in the behavior of the variables over the sample. So you can see here that the, the result change whether you look at the full sample or the first part or the last part. Um, so I think I'm going to skip these things and I'm just gonna go to, um, oops, maybe give you the, So this one is an interesting one, just instability. So here, it looks at different um, models because uh, for BMA, you need to decide on the priors. I told you that there are a number of things that you have to decide what the prior is. So I looked at different setup of the priors, and also I looked at their performance relative to principal components. So um, having uh, on the top being good, and if you go, if you are less than zero, is bad. So this is how BMA does relative to PCA. So if you are here, BMA is better. If you are less than zero, uh, PCA is better, and then up is bigger. So you can see that there is a lot of kind of instability. You cannot really say that this method is uh, unanimously better than the other. And also depending on if you're looking and which value, if you're looking at industrial production or if you're looking at uh, inflation. That brings me to time variance. So now in economics and econometrics, people do not commit to one model. So there's a huge issue looking at time varying forecasting model. Uh, if you're looking at geographically, not time, so you're gonna have kind of spatially varying model because as we see, there's a lot of instability, things are changing uh, in the economy, in the economy, the, um, the, structural, um, uh, the structure of the economy is changing, and you cannot just say this model is gonna be working all the time. Um, and all the, the methods being BMA or principal components, as you said, have we seen, uh, give us different uh, choices. Now, um, one of the, the things in 
uh, Bayesian uh, moving averages has said you have to put a prior about the probability of a variable being in the model. So this is here, my posterior. So in my prior, I started with 50%. I don't know anything. I don't know if this variable, for example, industrial production uh, measures, there are a number of industrial production measures in the, on the national accounts. I don't know if that variable is, is more likely to be in the model than another maybe financial variable or exchange rate variable. I don't know that. So they were all 50%. So 50% is there. Now, when I do the estimation, the information from the data, I get different estimates of these probabilities. So now, some, some variables have very small probability that goes to zero. Some have high probability that shoots out above 50%. So it's very informative because it tells you, okay, you start from a belief of 50% and then the, the data gives you new information and then you revise that belief and now some vari variables are more likely to be in there. Now the different colors are different priors on, other, uh, on the parameters. You can see setting the prior is very important because some priors shrink the variables into probabilities into zeros some prior flatten it. So this yellow prior here makes everything still close to 0.5. Other priors really select some variables as important and the rest as not important. So it's very kind of important to know that priors drive a lot of things that you get in the result. So I'm just going to kind of conclude for... Um, um, for the case of uh, inflation, the economic case. So as I said, there is no kind of clear winner because, as I said, it depends on the measure of performance you use. Are you looking at the point forecast and your measure is the average performance? So that's what the mean square error, forecast error. Uh, in that case, the differences are not really significant because you can test if those dif differences are not significant enough. So we have proper tests in econometrics that we do that, that were recently uh, developed. Uh, if you look at this time varying local performance, we've seen that there are uh, a lot of variations. There is this time variation in the performance of the models. And then um, what I find is that um, uh, BMA uh, um, BMA is, is well suited to cases where you want to predict uh, what we call extreme events. So if you're looking at the distribution of future values of inflation, some values are going to be in the middle, which are more likely, but then you have some values that are going to be in the tail. So extreme events, um, BMA is, is, uh, detects those extreme events better than principal components. Principal components is very good in predicting the average performance. So if your uh, inflation in the future happens to be very usual value, not, not, much shock, not many shocks to the economy, PCR seems to do well. But when there are a lot of shocks in the economy, maybe there is financial crisis and all those kind of unexpected events, BMA outperforms. So BMA was better in kind of detecting those extreme events in the tails of the distribution. Uh, and that's why it is so BMA um, does not do in terms of average because PCR just looks at the average, doesn't look at things that are unusual, but BMA was better in, in the quantile. So I think this probably um, uh, completes the talk. So I think what I wanted to say is that all these methodologies summarize some information in the data. Uh, what we have to be kind of worried about is the assumption between, behind each model, and then the fact that what you put in uh, more f a lot of time is what you get out from um, yeah, your modeling. And thanks. Thank you, Professor Rashida. Uh, uh, yes, uh, any, any questions or, or comments? Perhaps because we are not working in, uh, in this special topic of, our <clears throat> of financing and, and world uh, economics. 
but uh, we are rather working, sometimes we see the Bayesian methods applied to some specific data like the Nino, as you said. And uh, in that context, uh, uh, we find at least some criticisms on the way the data is used, because working with averages, it uh, doesn't provide the actual means of how the system is functioning. Mm -hmm. That will be our perhaps our main remarks on on the application of most statistical methods, especially when you talk about averaging or let's say precipitation, which is something very simple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it is not the same when you use, let's say in any model, 30 millimeters of precipitation as an average. And to see what is going to happen is going to be runoff, is going to be evaporated, for instance. Because why? Because this 30 millimeters, it is not the same if in reality, the 30 millimeters, let's say, uh, went down there in three days mm -hmm. or one millimeter a day, as it, it could happen in some other yeah. areas. And, and that brings us some conceptual problems in our interpretation of the idea. Yeah, but that's right. So I think, I don't know how much regression mm -hmm. models in your, in your application, you use a lot of regression models? No. Well, some, some people do. Yeah, some because people regression do. model, I think a lot of people forget that regression model is just looking at the mean. Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to say, if, if this variable x is equal to 2, what's the value of y on average, right? So that's why it gives you. So it's an average. It doesn't tell you anything in the tails. And I think now, um, a lot of people, like you say, instead of having the average, you can look at the distribution of rainfalls. Mm. All the possible values of rainfalls, you have the middle of the distribution, which is the average, and then you, you also have information about what's the likelihood to be in the extreme high or the extreme low. Mm. Maybe, you know, you have a flood or maybe you have a drought, right? So I think there are models where instead of just forecasting one point, so Bayesian methods can actually can forecast the whole distribution if you wanted. It's just that people still look at, an, at the, the average or the middle value of the distribution because they want one number. But if you are uh, interested in how it looks everywhere, then you can still get information using Bayesian method. Of course, you can use other methods because Bayesian method also you need the priors and all these things. Maybe you, you don't want to do that, you're not uh, comfortable with that, but you can use other methods which build the, the whole probability uh, around, um, yeah, that's future value. And it's true because now people do what we call quantile regression, which looks at what is the lowest 25%. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, in, in finance, they want to look, they, there is value at risk that is an estimate of what is the, the maximum loss that uh, you can incur in the next 24 hours, and banks use that to, for insurance, and it's a very important number, and it determines with the, the, the lowest uh, 10%. So they need to know what is the 10% point. So they, know, they don't look at the average, but they look at the lowest 10%. So they look at the, they look at, they look at the percentile or the quantile. So I think there are, yeah, there are applications also in economics where people don't want the average. I mean, people look at the median because the median is more informative, for example, for wealth and development studies because, yeah, the median income or the average income, right? So, mm -hmm. and people want to look, to look at the median instead of the average because it's more informative and a regression model doesn't do that, doesn't tell us anything about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're right. So, yeah, so it's good to know the whole distribution <laughs> and then work with that, I guess, then, yeah, or just the average point. Okay, well, th thank you very much. I don't want to take more of your time. I just want to thank everybody thank for, for coming here, for each of you. And of course, the thanks to the Institute of Geography for allowing us to, to present this um, conference by Dr. Rashida Ruiz. And also, thanks for the friends and colleagues in YouTube and uh, in, the international, in the channel of the Institute of Geography. Thank you. Thank you for 
you, Rashida, and thank you for Samira to allow you to <laughs> to come over. Yeah. And thanks, thanks everybody. Good, good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, sorry, I just want to, to give you one. Uh, sorry, forgot the important thing. I, I want to give you just a recognition from the institute. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, That's very uh, useful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> thank okay. You thank you.